Very pleased to welcome you here to this afternoon's annual innovation lecture for the Warren Centre, um, both people in the room and also online. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathering, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, I should also acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands in which you might be participating online. We pay our respects to our, their elders, past, present and emerging. So the Warren Centre Innovation Lecture now has been going for over 25 years. When we started this program back in the end of the last century, innovation was a pretty marginal concept in Australia. Uh, it was understood as important, but not really well understood. Today, it's absolutely central to economic prosperity, and that's why we've uh, focused on, on this year's theme. So why space? Space, uh, for many years in Australia, was kind of low key. Um, in recent years, with the funding the federal government, as others have put into it, it's become an absolute powerhouse and it, with huge potential for our economy. So we're looking very much forward to hearing what Catherine Pe Bennell Pegg has to say about it today and engaging with her. I also mentioned that uh, her colleague, Enrico Palermo, was the innovation lecturer probably 10 years ago or more. Uh, but at that time, speaking from, from Virgin Galactic, where he was a senior uh, engineer. So I'd like to now pass over to our MC for today, uh, Professor Ben Thornber, to take you through the program. Right, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and uh, welcome to those of you joining us from the studio and those uh, joining us virtually. Uh, as a brief introduction, uh, if I haven't uh, met you yet, I'm the Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Sydney, and I'm very pleased to join you here this evening in this excellent event. Uh, for those of you in the studio, first of all, there's a few housekeeping items. In the case of a fire, please exit out the back doors and proceed through the glass doors. The evacuation meeting point is located up the stairs in the courtyard. Uh, lavatories are located on level one to the right of the ticket sales booth. The lecture will be filmed and made available online following the event. If you have any concerns about the filming, please inform the support staff. Light refreshments will be served for the in-person participants following the presentation. Now, very importantly, I would, would like to point out that there will be a Q&A session following the presentation. So for those of you online, you can start submitting questions during the presentation. We'd really encourage you to do that. We will be sorting through the questions as the presentation is going on. So please feel free to submit questions during the session. Okay, so um, it is my very great pleasure this evening to um, introduce Catherine Bennell Pegg. Uh, most particular, particularly as we're welcoming, welcoming her back to the faculty, as Catherine is an alum of the university, graduating in 2007 with a double degree in space aeronautical engineering and physics. Now, following the program here at the University of Sydney, she was commissioned into the Australian Army and receiving the Sword of Honour as the course dukes. She then undertook master's courses across institutions in Spain, Germany, and the UK, gaining an MSc in space technology in Lulea Techniska Universita, apologies, uh, and Julius Maximilianus Universitat uh, Würzburg, and an MSc in space engineering and astronautics at Cranfield University. Now, following internships at the European Space Agency, ESTEC in Nordwijk in Holland, and NASA Ames, she joined Airbus in Stevenage, UK, as a mission systems engineer in 2010, before progressing um, to project manager, advanced projects for orbital systems and exploration, and project manager and systems engineer of robotic projects, and finally, uh, Bartolo Bartolomeo Service Operations Lead. In 2019, she returned to Australia to join the Australian Space Agency in Space Capability and Robotics and Automation, where in 2020, Catherine was recognized as one of the top 40 young South Australian business leaders. In March 2022, she was appointed Director of Space Technology and is responsible for access to space, spaceflight in infrastructure, and human spaceflight, with a near-term focus on delivering programs of the Fast Tracking Access to Space initiative. So this includes space flights, spaceports, 
and exploring options for an Australian astronaut program. So I could have extended this introduction quite a bit, uh, quite a bit longer, and I think it says uh, it says a lot that, uh, that that you know some of the names that I haven't mentioned include uh, include courses at MIT and Oxford University. So really in, in, in impressive background, and so I'm sure, like me, you're eager to hear more from our outstanding presenter. So please welcome uh, Catherine to the stage, Catherine. Thank you, Ben and Chris. It's a pleasure to be here to give the Warren Centre Innovation Lecture for 2022. It was about 18 years ago since I first entered Sydney University as an undergrad, half a lifetime ago. I think it was um, during my university review that I last stood on the stage at the Seymour Centre. But um, when I finished my undergrad at Sydney University, I wanted to develop space missions. And so I went overseas and I never looked back. I just didn't believe that I'd be able to have a career doing what I wanted to do in this country. But I was wrong. It is now entirely possible to have a compelling space career in Australia. It's more than possible, in fact, it's lucrative. Nowhere else in the world can you be part of growing and shaping a space sector that's nascent but yet has so much potential. To the point that today, I will even make the case for space as the next frontier for Australian innovation. And I'm going to start with a video. Three, two, one. From getting to places we once never dreamed of, to designing the next generation of satellite communications, we are researching, building, and testing the technology that helps Australia take the next step. Our precision manufacturing enables Australians to be part of global supply chains so that we can develop the technology that orbits in space and build the ground infrastructure that supports space activities in our southern skies. The application of these space technologies also helps to keep us safe. During times of bushfires and floods, emergency services use satellite images to understand the bigger picture mapping areas and pinpointing locations, saving lives in the face of disaster. So now that we know what space technology does for us today, what opportunities does it hold for us tomorrow? The Australian Space Agency, growing and transforming the Australian space industry. I imagine many of you may have watched the Virgin Galactic launch or Perseverance landing on Mars uh, just months ago. But that's just the tip of the iceberg of what space does. As it shows in the video, uh, space can make us dream and thrill us, but it really is strongly underpinning society. But how to define space? I'm going to use an analogy. Uh, when explorer Ernest Shackleton set sail from England to explore Antarctica, he wasn't the only ship that set sail that day. There were military vehicles, fishing vehicles, recreational boats, he might be the only one that's remembered in the history books or that inspired others to sail the seas or build beautiful ships. But the ocean is just a place. It's a place where industries have breadth. Space is just like the ocean. Its industry and applications have breadth beyond what is famous. Space is a place that is the ultimate high ground. We can select different orbits to be close or far away to hover over a single point or to move quickly over lots of ground. From the eye in the sky, we can see phenomenon from around the world. And for this reason, space has been used to monitor our climate, to track refugees, to monitor water. But what you can see, you can connect. Just like a super high mobile phone tower, satellites can connect different parts around the world and they can communicate information. And what you can connect, you can inform. For example, sending position, navigation and timing data for GPS. Um, helping autonomous vehicles to navigate and supporting our remote industries. To deliver all of these requires space assets. And these assets have to be put up there responsibly and operated securely. And that creates an economy of other services for space users, such as space situational awareness and debris monitoring, launch and in-space mobility. And as we begin to scale our activities, autonomous systems are going to become increasingly important as well. A space system isn't just in space, though. It extends beyond space back down to Earth and is comprised of four segments. 
We have, of course, the space segment with satellites, satellite constellations, space stations, rovers. We have the launch segment with the launches to put objects into space and returns as well. We have the ground segment, telemetry, tracking, control, operations. And of course, the user segment, which is the point of all of it, the parties that use space data, the data that's generated by space or communicated to them by space. So space is just a place that informs all these activities. It's also a place to do pure science that helps us to understand the Earth's origins and our future. It's a place to use the environment of microgravity to look at physical phenomena or to manufacture special products like long and pure optical fibres. It's a place that creates industries that can bootstrap technologies. For example, when solar power, the industry waned in the 1970s, the continued development of the technology in use by NASA is what helped it be pulled through to a point at which it was commercially viable and affordable. Space can help address global challenges like climate change directly through the provision of data or indirectly through helping to develop new technologies. In fact, space is fundamentally relevant to helping to address each one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But it's also a place to do business. It spans industries, is pulling talent into STEM fields and is incubating new business models. For these reasons and more, the global space economy has transitioned to what some call space 4.0 or new space, where space is evolving from being the preserve of a few major space powers to a situation in which there are multiple space actors around the world, new space nations and companies alike. According to Euroconsult, the global space market totaled 370 billion US dollars in 2021 and is expected to grow 74% by 2030. And it's the vast amount of capital behind it which is giving organisations to take on the flexibility to take risks that recently only governments were able to take. The old adage to become a millionaire in space, start out as a billionaire, actually no longer holds, despite the fact that are about 70 billionaires have invested in space. And Australia has been part of this space journey since the beginning. We have a long and proud history in space, one of the longest in fact. Australia's Indigenous people are our first scientists and the world's oldest astronomers. Australia commenced its space projects in 1957 with a sounding rocket program at Woomera, which was followed by other rocket and propulsion programs, including the Europa program. We were one of the earliest nations to launch a satellite from our own territory and played an important role in the development of the Outer Space Treaty. We have a long-standing partnership with NASA on tracking deep space missions. We're a founding partner of Intelsat. But despite that great heritage and value, when the rest of the world accelerated their space capabilities in the 70s and 80s, we didn't keep up. We always continued our involvement in space in niche areas. We procured satellites, we operated satellites, but we haven't had an expansion phase until recently. But what an expansion phase we've had spurned on by the new accessibility of space and the ability to enter the space economy through lower cost means like CubeSats and the availability of private investors being interested in space. Around the mid 2010s, 2014 or so, there was an explosion in the amount of organisations in Australia that started to do space, universities and startups alike. International conferences that I was at became flooded with all these young Australians that had something to say. Australia then held um, the International Astronautical Congress, the world's largest space conference, in 2017 in Adelaide. The giggle factor about space was reduced and more and more society realised that space can critically um, help our economy and underpins our daily lives. And so the space agency emerged from this background in 2018 with a strong industry growth mandate with the purpose to transform and grow a globally respected space industry that uplifts the broader economy and improves the lives of Australians. Our role is to be the central coordination point for Australia's space activities. Our goal is to triple the size of the sector to $12 billion and create an additional 20,000 jobs by 2030. So yes, our, our top level KPIs are jobs and growth, and this is quite different to many other traditional space agencies around the world that are very science driven. What this afforded us in the early days of the agency, years of the agency, was the ability to focus on delivering operationalised capability and capability that would have a sustainable industry behind it. But now, as we approach our fourth birthday, 
and grow and evolve, we're looking at how we can expand what we do, including further considerations for science. But 20,000 new space jobs, that is no small goal. So um, in 2019, um, at the time, the government released the Civil Space Strategy to help achieve it. This set out a 10-year vision for how we'd go about doing this. And the strategy identified seven areas considered to have the greatest opportunity for Australia to deliver into international markets, but also to meet national Australian needs. These areas are called the Civil Space Priority Areas, or SPAs, if we need a three-letter acronym. They are communications, technologies and services. Earth observation as well, or EO, as I'll be referring to it today. It also includes position, navigation and timing, traditionally thought of as GPS by many. Robotics and automation on Earth and in space. Space situational awareness and debris monitoring, or SSA. Access to space, which is something I'm really enjoying working on at the moment. And Leapfrog R&D, within which we've started to focus on applied space medicine and life sciences as an area of opportunity for Australia. So the strategy calls for the development of roadmaps for each of these SPAs. And my role within my first two years or so at the agency was to lead this roadmaps activity and set up the method. The roadmaps are a mechanism to build on activities to date, to recognise areas of opportunity for our industry and to identify where we can have a significant role in the future. They're the basis upon which all of our future programs will be designed and delivered. And our goal with them is to have an aligned, connected and informed Australian space sector that's united behind shared visions and ambitions for each priority area. For a capability to be included in the roadmap, we have really strict inclusion criteria. And this is important because we want to make sure that these are objective pieces of work, not subjective pieces of work that are enduring. So we're looking for areas with high competitive or comparative advantage and or high national need to be delivered, ideally both. And the reason that we're wanting to play into gaps with strengths, the definition of competitive advantage, is because leveraging our strengths means that we can have exportable products. We can collaborate meaningfully with international organisations and nations, which can teach our industry to help build the rest of the ecosystem. So when we're identifying these areas where Australia can have world leading strengths, we're also looking at building up the surrounding ecosystem around that. So we have a methodical evidence-based approach. We, we assess opportunity across the country and speak to the sector. We set the 10-year targets. We devise the pathways between the two, and then we implement the roadmap. For each of building up each of these roadmaps, um, we have a technical advisory group. Members of Sydney University are part of some of those. And that's really important because um, it's the experts and the members of our sector that we will be delivering these vision, on these visions with. So far, we've delivered the Earth Observation Roadmap, the Communications Roadmap and the Robotics Roadmap. Space Situational Awareness and Applied Space Medicine Life Sciences will be released very shortly and the other two by the end of the year. But the SPAs don't exist in isolation, despite that they each have a roadmap developed. They're all interconnected, reliant on cross-cutting technology areas, facilitated by non-technical enabling activities and can be applied to cross-cutting services. So to try and explain that, um, I developed this diagram that I call the space capability nexus. And that's because to map capability requires in effect these four dimensions, which perhaps is the case for any other innovation ecosystem as well. You can see the SPAs listed in the middle there. So that's our technical capabilities. Um, and I'm going to take you through the diagram now. So the cross-cutting technology areas are the technology areas from the broader economy that are critically underpinning, underpinning our SPA technology capabilities. These were found in effect bottom up. When we were first doing the roadmaps, these topics just kept bubbling up in the second or third order and they demonstrated both opportunity and a vulnerability that we really needed to bring forward because by propelling these forward, we can we can facilitate more robust development pathways for our space capability. Moving on to facilitators now. These facilitators are our ecosystem builders. They enable streamlined processes and approaches towards realising capability. And implementation of these by all actors across the sector will help us to, to realise our vision for the space sector by 2030. 
Then cross-cutting services. These are the areas of high opportunity for the application of Australian space capability, as well as those that have an element of national need and interest. They each draw upon capabilities spanning more than one space priority area. And within each of these, there are of course really different market factors at play. But if we can identify common needs, common technology needs across them, we can find opportunities for our industry to scale and use its investments um, in a sensible way. So today I'm going to cover a few key topics. Um, Earth's observation, access to space, exploration services, and uh, industry resilience, workforce and skills. So firstly, Earth observation. <coughs> Excuse me. So EO from space allows us to examine and monitor our planet. It's that eye in the sky I talked about before. And we know EO data has such a meaningful impact on our everyday lives. Every time you look at the weather in Australia, you're benefiting from over 30 Earth observation satellite data feeds. As the sixth largest country on Earth, we really rely on EO data to manage our industries and our land and our resources. According to Deloitte, EO directly contributed 283 million Australian dollars to the economy in financial year 1920. But with the satellite imagery being used downstream, that generated further benefits for end users of more than two and a half billion dollars. And that's incredible. But for this, Australia is really reliant on the data streams from overseas. And there are certain data of interest that aren't even able to be provided by the global marketplace at this point. And as such, there exists an urgent and growing need for Australian EO to, to be better positioned to build sovereign capability, particularly for assured access to the global streams of EO data. So by contributing into that space, we can assure other streams of data are provided to Australia as well. So the applications of importance include measuring and mitigating climate change, responding to bushfires and floods and other natural disasters, providing better insights to grow our economy and to manage our agriculture and other industries. And so building capability and expertise within this decade in the upstream or manufacturing part of the EO sector is considered to be critical. And our Earth Observation Roadmap sets out a plan to achieve this. And for each of our roadmaps, the Australian Space Agency's role in them is enacted in many ways through our programs. And so our biggest program to date, by an order of magnitude, is what we call the National Mission for Earth Observation, mission in the policy sense. So this is a space program that involves many missions within it. And the Australian government committed $1.2 billion of investment to our national mission for EO. This is led by us at the Australian Space Agency, but we couldn't do, do it without our close partners um, in Geoscience Australia, CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology and Defence. It's a whole of government activity. The first part of this program is going to see Australia design, build, develop and operate four new satellites. That's really exciting. And the satellites are what we call cross-calibration satellites and they're specialised hyperspectral small sats. Each will play a unique role in the global Earth observing system. They're going to fly under other land imaging satellites and they'll collect high quality data that helps us to have consistent and comparable data streams across them and across future satellites that may launch. They're going to enable users to compare and contrast data and combine data from the many different types of EO that are generated globally. And this carves out an important role for Australia internationally as well. And will transition importantly from becoming a space consumer to a space contributor, which is a major milestone for our nation. It'll make us more sufficient, but beyond just the EO application, it sets the stage for us to be more successful and capable for all elements of our activities in the space industry in the future. Now I'm gonna to move to access to space. So our roadmap for access to space is just in its first stage of development, and it's planned to be released around the end of this year. Access to space, we all think about rockets, but it goes beyond rockets. It's about removing barriers for all parties to utilise space and accelerates the transformation in that way of the entire space sector. Australia's participation in the global space sector is very reliant on demonstrating that our products work in space, called space qualification, and that they 
and realizing increasing operational opportunity with those products known as space heritage. And to generalize, space qualification can be critical for attracting partners and investors, and space heritage can be critical for obtaining customers. But today, um, while we're seeing a lot of increasing activity with Australian organizations putting payloads in orbit, we still don't have very many. It's, it's a journey. And the hardest part is translating our really good research, which is at low technology readiness levels or to the left of the chart you see on your screen, through what's known as the valley of death, TRL 4 to 7, to having products in space and being operationalised. And this is something that by, by fast tracking, we can help Australia to develop space capability faster and more robustly. So, Pulling things through the valley of space, creating that access to space, occurs when organisations can access all parts of the space value chain. It allows us to have more rapid innovation cycles and to prevent Australian technology from being leapfrogged by, by competitors around the world. It's critical to bridge the gap from where we are today to a space sector that can provide many competitive services to both Australia and the global economy. Now, an important nuance though is that you don't have to have every single part of the space value chain in Australia to be able to access it. So as we're looking at this roadmap, we're trying to understand where is it that it's worth focusing on in Australia or not. And what we can say already is that Australia does have sufficient competitive advantage against our roadmap inclusion criterion for us to target a part of the launch activities. And this is because our land down under has a unique and clear view of the sky. We have really desirable geography for targeted orbits, polar orbits and equatorial orbits. We have wide open ranges and long coastlines, a stable political environment and responsible regulations. And we're also developing the launch vehicles and technologies at home that will take our products into space. Of course, that doesn't mean that only Australian companies will launch here, but it does mean we're going to take care to ensure jobs and capability growth here in Australia. Major global space players are already looking to our shores to launch. On Sunday, Australian spaceport Equatorial Launch Australia will host Australia's first commercial launch from the Northern Territory, from Australia, ever. And the customer is NASA. So our intentions are clear. We want to become a launch nation of choice to attract further private sector investment and uplift the capability of Australia's space sector. So Australia is go for launch and to help foster this investment and accelerate this activity, um, we recently announced the $65 million fast-tracking access to space initiative, which includes funding for spaceports, space flights for payloads, a student space challenge to put student payloads into space, and we're investigating a framework for human space flight, as well as removing fees for launch applications. Now, exploration services. This one is one that I'm really passionate about. It's been over 50 years now since the first man moon landing, when three people sat atop the largest, most powerful rocket ever built, called the Saturn V. And a few seconds after that rocket roared to life, the astronauts were jolted hard back into their seats and accelerated to a speed 11 times the speed of sound. They soared to the moon, put humanity's first footprints on another world, and then returned safely home. And what an incredible feat in a world that didn't even yet have internet or even Instagram. 3D printers or even post-it notes and com laptop computers or even powerful calculators. In fact, modern calculators are more powerful than the Apollo 11 flight computer. So what motivated such explorers and indeed society to continue to invest its limited resources into this and other endeavours? I believe we can answer in two ways, the emotional or intangible and the tangible. We humans have a powerful emotional compulsion to explore, to satisfy our curiosity and to leave a legacy. And it is this that helps us when we're young to come up with the dreams that guide our lives. It's what has us slog through years of engineering or science study to get to a point at which we can concretely contribute. But going to the moon is hard. What you see here, is a scaled drawing of the distance between Earth and the Moon. It's far, really far. You can actually line up every other planet in our solar system end to end, and approximately that's the distance you get. 
Distance means communication challenges. The curse of the inverse square law calls for different kinds of communication to be able to get back data from the moon and to send data up there. So that creates opportunities for things like optical communication or maybe even in a few decades, X-ray communication. It's outside the protection of the Van Allen radiation belts and one of the most challenging environments from a computing standpoint in a type of missions that you'll probably want more autonomous systems. The orbital dynamics up there are harder to manage. They, things skid around. It's not as obvious as the Earth orbit. And on the surface, the thermal environment and the dust are pretty hellish. Not to mention that it's more costly by an order of magnitude to put anything up there per kilogram. And for the last 49 and a half years, human spaceflight has focused on that small little dark bit right next to the Earth called low Earth orbit. So why go back to the moon? They're performing great research there. Well, the tangible reasons that we want to go back to the moon include that the moon has a wealth of scientific knowledge about the sun, the earth, and the solar system. It's a powerful body for our species to understand, to see the origins of earth, humanity, and what our future might look like. It's a compelling test ground for building the technologies for humans to explore further and also to develop sustainable systems here on earth. And to support all of this effort to go to the moon calls for the beginnings of a commercial space supply chain providing the underpinning infrastructure when we go there and go there to stay. NASA is leading the international effort which is called the Artemis program, named for the twin sister of Apollo. And because of this, humanity is on the cusp of a huge space exploration and space industrialization endeavor. And this has inspirational, economic, geostrategic, and capability growth opportunities that translate across the broader economy. Inspiration, because the breakthrough discoveries will inspire the next generation of thought and ingenuity. Economic, because space exploration is one of the fastest growing space market segments. Geostrategic, because the scale of Artemis means no country can do it alone. It involves the meeting of like-minded nations for their best and brightest to work on solving these challenges um, and setting the stage for cooperation on, on other challenging technical problems. And capability growth. Each partner nation in exploration plays its part, strengthening their own competitive advantages that they claim that can then be reused across the rest of their space sector. For example, Canada, through science and exploration, using the Canada arm on the shuttle and the space station, was able to create an entire robotics industry in Canada and create medical breakthroughs for medical robotics. But this is all great, but why does it matter for Australia? Why should we get involved and not just leave it to the major space superpowers? First, the emotional. We've long been a land of explorers and adventurers, travellers and trailblazers. We've traversed all manner of terrains, chased the horizon in every direction, climbed higher, descended deeper, gone further. And still, the quest continues. There will always be more to explore. So, where to from here? We say, bring on the beyond. Our boldest adventure yet. Australia, we're going to the moon. So let's trust in Australian ingenuity. We have much to offer, and what we have to offer isn't putting suitcases of cash in a rocket and blasting it off to the moon. It's about generating jobs and growth and broader space capability and scientific knowledge here in Australia, in both space and adjacent industries, by leveraging our strengths into global space exploration gaps. As, emer as an emerging space nation, we have more to gain from being involved in exploration than the mature ones. Because through international cooperation and collaboration, we can learn, there are more opportunities for new entrants, we can demonstrate our capabilities to the world stage in a very visible way. We can work with international partners and build the relationships and knowledge to know how to enter global supply chains. It can also be a relatively low budget way to have visible positive technical partnerships with other like-minded nations. And finally, the challenges of the cislunar environment will help the rest of our space sector to be pushed and to learn and to grow. 
We've identified three areas of priority for Australia to play in exploration, and these have been confirmed with partner nations that also find these interesting. These are foundation services, health services, and communication services. There are other topics of interest, of course, but these have really emerged as key focal points. And much of the capability for these stems from spinning in our world-leading approaches from our remote industries. Because by virtue of Australia's vastness and harsh climate, by necessity, our industries have had to handle challenging environments and distance and have complex operations in extreme environments with appropriate levels of automation at the edge. Capabilities from our remote industries can translate beautifully into space. So first of all, translating advanced communications to exploration com com communication services. So Australia has solid foundations in communications with many world-class niches. Um, of note are our optical communications ground station developments to get high volumes of data down quickly. This will be key for lunar applications. We also have Internet of Things from Space, or IoT, that are working already um, generating revenues through low Earth orbit for terrestrial industries. We can translate the application of these sensor networks or sensors on the surface of the Earth to the lunar environment for scientific research about the lunar environment or to track assets up there. We also have an extensive history in the development of telemedicine and remote health services, such as from the Royal Flying Doctor Services, our air ambulances, or in our Australian Antarctic Division. We have hyperbaric test facilities, simulation and spacesuit technologies in development. Um, exploration activities can present an important pathway to translate these into space, and from what we learn by operating in this way in space, bring back learnings to our terrestrial sector. Today, sophisticated space facilities like the International Space Station or Exploration Rovers are usually operated by many nations, um, by big teams, all working around the clock. And this is just not commercially sustainable as we build a more commercial space ecosystem in low Earth orbit, such as through the Lunar, sorry, the LEO Commercial Destinations Program. Um, or we go back to the moon. So a key gap to unlock space progress is trusted autonomy or further autonomous systems. And if we can do this, so many more applications become possible. Australian field robotics have niche capabilities relevant to the space domain. Advanced perception, AI, rugged working robotics that can work collaboratively. This is recognised with Australian teams winning many challenges around the world. Our resources sector leads the world in remotely operating facilities and autonomous systems in GPS denied environments as well. Of note is remote operations capability for simultaneously managing large complex systems, such as entire mine sites from thousands of kilometres away. And the technical uniqueness from this stems from clever systems engineering approaches and software that have appropriate levels of autonomous capability at different layers in the architecture. All of this expertise can be spun into space. We lead that field and other space nations recognise that and want to see what we have to offer. The moon will have many challenges these can be applied to solving. So I, in the course of the robotics and automation roadmap, we coined the term exploration foundation services to mean operational services that support missions to build towards and maintain a sustained office presence. The industrialised services on the moon, such as monitoring and inspection, planning and logistics and civil construction. And we feel that Australia can be the key provider of this infrastructure to help propel forward exploration and science by our partners around the world. And we're supporting all of these priorities through our Moon to Mars initiative, which includes a demonstrator program, a supply chain program, and our flagship Trailblazer program. Trailblazer is an exciting and significant step for Australia. In 2026, we're going to launch an Australian-made rover to the moon, 20 kilogram class. And what it's going to do there is fly with a NASA in-situ resource utilisation system that, transmit, that translates the lunar regolith and extracts oxygen. And we're going to be delivering samples of that lunar regolith to that plant. So actually performing a foundation service at the same time as demonstrating our progress and the ability to have autonomous capabilities work with Australian rovers on the moon. So looking across all of these, um, for each of these three exploration areas, what we can see is the establishment of a virtuous innovation cycle.
So in this virtuous innovation cycle, innovation can begin at any point, right? But usually for the case for space in Australia, it starts with the terrestrial applications. These can spin into space applications where further uh, knowledge and capabilities are developed. It can spin back, sorry, spin out to new terrestrial applications that are created by that new knowledge or technology. And that backfills into the original application it came from in the first place. So let's use an example. I talked about our resources sector. Our resources sector are some key players in it, are interested in working in space, not to mine space, but because it means that they can be at the cutting edge of technology developments, they can diversify into long-term markets, they can propel and inspire a skilled workforce, and they can learn by being the ones that solve the problems in space. That means when they spin out into their terrestrial markets, they're preventing disruption because if space actors solve this problem on their own, they could come and be new entrants into the terrestrial industries. So the learnings from that can then spin back into the more traditional resource sector operations. This is also the case for space medicine. It's also the case for, for communications. So I put it to you that why innovation is important and necessary for space. Space is also important for driving the innovation economy and ecosystem across Australia more broadly. Realising space opportunities for our industry though were not possible without a highly skilled STEM workforce. So people often talk about there being many diverse career types needed in the space sector. This is true, almost any career type can be applied to the space sector because it has breadth, it's that ocean. But perhaps due to personal bias, I believe that one of the most powerful ways to enter and contribute to the space sector is through engineering. Engineering is at the core of creating new missions and new value. It's the innovation driver. It's how we go from a single scientific question to create a specific mission design and then deliver it. It creates technologies that achieve what was impossible when those questions were first asked. It translates the designs into product policy and platform designs that can then close business models. But while engineering is important for space, space is also important for engineering. Space engineering is engineering at its most extreme. Even if the technologies aren't always cutting edge, the systems certainly are. They're under a lot of stress because they have to be optimised for extreme environments in terms of performance, in terms of business cases, and in terms of delivery times if they're delivering for commercial customers. So I encourage all Australian engineers to look to space as an opportunity for their career. And there's few places where better to translate engineers of other kinds into becoming space engineers than in Australia. Overseas, many uh, careers in the space sector are born and die in the space sector. Everyone loves it, no one wants to leave, so it's hard for new entrants. But the cross-fertilisation of ideas and techniques is a real advantage that Australia can capitalise on. One type of engineer we're seeing a bottleneck, though, which is limiting our ability to realise our opportunities, is systems engineers. Space systems engineers are the conductor of the engineering orchestra and to build that capability you really need to have real world experience. Our missions like Trailblazer, like the National Space Mission for Earth Observation will definitely help to build this. But we need to move faster and our organisations are bringing home Australians, they are attracting global talent, but we still need to move faster to keep up with the demand. It's also important we foster the workforce from the ground up. Space is a gateway passion for all STEM fields. While AI may excite adults, I never have seen a child turn up to a princess party in a, in a blockchain costume. <laughs> when I graduated from high school, I didn't even know what engineering was. I had no idea. I applied to study space engineering simply because it had space in the degree title. And I'm so glad I did. So since joining the Space Agency just over two years ago, it's been super amazing to see the transition we've made as a sector, how rapidly our industry continues to grow and the opportunities at our fingertips. We're seeing increasing investment, both private and public. To date, since the Australian government set up the Australian Space Agency, the government's committed well over $2 billion. We've seen an increasing number of Australian payloads being prepared for orbit and being launched to orbit. Um, universities across our country have stepped up and invested significantly in space programs. 
we've seen an increase in private deal flow, both in the number of deals and in the volume of each of those deals. Just now, we at the Space Agency are wrapping up 16 different projects that we funded through our early programs to the tune of about $36 million. And each of those are demonstrating the creation of jobs and capability across the sector. Just last week, um, active construction began in Western Australia on the European Space Agency's fourth deep space antenna in the country. And Australia is involved in the design, development and delivery of that. And recent announcements from the government are going to build more momentum. Announcements this year have included the Space Strategic Update. This is a unified national plan to shape the Australian space sector over the next two decades. I spoke about fast-tracking access to space, Australia's mission to the moon. We also have um, additional funding to work with partner nations. The National Space Mission for Earth Observation, our largest program by an order of magnitude, and of course the Modern Manufacturing Initiative, which is helping our industries to scale and even build satellite manufacturing facilities. So we're evolving and we're scaling, and we're building our competition, our reputation as a competitive and talented international player. But as we grow, we need to do this sensibly, grounded in focusing on our strengths. It will take us time to develop, and it's the 2030s where we'll really start to see operational implementation of many of the capabilities we're road mapping and identifying and growing today across our sector. So the Australian space sector is innovating for space, but not just for space's sake. Space, after all, is just a place. Space innovation is for Earth, to extend our Earth infrastructure into space and to underpin modern society and to help address global challenges. It's for industry, to create new value and grow productivity. And it's for discovery, to better understand our country and our world, its history, its present and its future. Space is a frontier, the next frontier for Australian innovation. Thank you. Great, thank you very Thank you very much, Catherine. Absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. And we'd now like to invite uh, questions, uh, both from the audience, if you would like to raise your hands, if you have a question, we have some roving microphones uh, who will uh, come and uh, pick you up. Uh, and we've also got quite a few questions on uh, online. So uh, perhaps while the people in the studio are, are considering their first uh, question, uh, we could take one from online first. So we have a question, which is, which engineering disciplines do you see the most need for uh, to realize the ambitious space priorities? Thank you for the question. We need all forms of engineers. Any form of engineering can be applied to opportunities in space. But as I mentioned, a major bottleneck is in the space system engineering discipline. Often to be a space system engineer, you can start out in another discipline and build your knowledge before you translate in, or you can go in into niche parts of that. So I see that as um, a major area that we need to develop. But honestly, um, people should just follow their passions and uh, in what interests them the most, and that can be applied to space. That's the best way to, to enter if you're an individual, but top down, um, building real world experience with space products and en any engineering discipline is what we need to see happen. Great, thank you very much. And uh, we have a question <laughs> over here, Nick. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Good, thank, yeah. uh, thanks. thanks for a great talk. Um, a general question really, space um, is challenging in terms of the environment. Um, rockets aren't particularly clean, some of them aren't, some of them are. But um, how, how is the space agency going to address the longer term environment, environmental impact of this expansion into space? Sure, very good question and an important consideration. So um, at the space agency, we operate under four pillars and one of those is responsible. Everything we do in space has to be responsible and we're actually looking at developing um, a roadmap or plan for space sustainability. But um, more directly, um, we have a part of the space agency um, that's the space regulator and they're responsible for um, delivering licenses for various different activities within the country. And 
when we set up things like spaceports or we look to launch, there are lots of important gates and checks that are looked at and in responsibility around the environment and the outcomes for the environment are absolutely paramount. So we're considering that in everything we do, the, the importance of being responsible. Great, thank you. And uh, if we move to our online questions now, uh, the agency plan is very broad and ambitious. Uh, should we narrow our focus to a smaller number of areas where Australia <coughs> can uh, achieve a global leadership position? Sure, um, thanks for the question. So I think by you know first looking at the breadth of our space priority areas, it looks like you know it's an extremely broad approach. But what we have to do first is, you know, assess where are the bits we should focus on in the near term. And to do that, we need to look across our sector. Within each of those areas, there are really potential to have world leading uh, niches in some areas. And then trying to find the common thread between those technologies and focus that into our world leading capabilities is what's interesting. So um, absolutely, focus is important in having any impactful strategy and implementation. And that's why when you look to our programs, we've really focused on foundation services for Trailblazer and on earth observation and creating that satellite development capability in the country because the competencies from both of those uh, set the foundation for potentially more of an expansion in our focus in the future. All right, thank you. And I think we had a question at the front here. Thank you. In many industries, when people have done studies in Australia, we've seen that the industries are very fragmented and that there's lots of players, often SMEs, small companies, and there's very little in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways we're seeing similar things in the space industry. Every city's now got its own little hub. Um, every university's got its own little program. And there are so many things going on in so many different areas. How do you see that this is all going to be brought together rather than be an activity of lots of little companies independently? Sure, yes, yeah, certainly our space sector is different to most of those in other nations and that we have a lot of startups and SMEs. Um, I think this is uh, just an outcome of the fact that our industry is nascent. We need more lighthouse missions for our industry to have to work together, to learn to work together and to build the consortiums to deliver the value that's needed. So I think it's, it's going to evolve. Um, and we're going to see um, the development of that ecosystem more and more. Um, the sector is taking their own initiatives to help do that as well, but at the space agency, things like our supply chain program and um, through implementing some of those facilitating activities, we're trying to help with that too. But it's the ecosystem that makes things possible uh, for technologies. Technologies don't exist in isolation, of course. Okay, so one more uh, a question online. Uh, do you think of the very large number of very similar startup CubeSats in Leo presents a future space debris problem? And if so, should their use be more regulated? Yes, the number of satellites, including CubeSats in low Earth orbit are growing. And there's something called the, the Kessler effect, which is quite straightforward modelling really, which says that even if we do nothing more today, natural collisions in low Earth orbit, or some key low Earth orbits, will escalate and mean that we have so much debris around Earth that will grow exponentially, it will be a huge problem to ever having satellites in those orbits. And that's something that around the world people are taking more and more notice of. It's been a theory for decades. Um, but yeah, with the advent of more CubeSats and the advent of some activities uh, in LEO causing increased debris, it's becoming more and more urgent. So in Australia, we have a big role to play there. We have our space situational awareness capabilities, so tracking debris through our large view of the sky. Um, and in our space situational awareness roadmap, we talk about the space debris problem. This will be released very shortly and what we can do to help address that from, Australia, from an Australian standpoint. But just now, um, one of my colleagues is in the UK talking about space sustainability and space situational awareness and the debris problem with our international partners because it's this sort of thing can only be addressed properly on the international stage and we have a strong voice at the UN uh, COPUS, which is where you talk about 
about outer space affairs and talk about how we can consider addressing these sorts of problems. But absolutely, it's a challenge that needs to be solved. The tragedy of the commons, I think, was developed for, you know, pastures in, in, in England a few centuries ago, but that even applies to space today. Great, thank you. And <laughs> Actually, you've uh, pretty well just answered my question because <laughs> it was about space sustainability that I wanted to ask. Um, and there's a lot of talk in the industry about a, su a, st a sustainability crisis. Uh, of, of looking forward to the end of the decade when there will be 100,000 spacecraft in orbit as part of these large mega constellations. Uh, and the Kessler syndrome looks, looks I think, very strongly. Um, since you've answered that part of it, though, I might switch to another concern <laughs> because my um, job is an astronomer. And of course, those mega constellations have a very big impact on ground-based astronomy and space-based. In fact, the Hubble telescope is already seeing satellite trails across 8% of its images. Uh, so so um, that's a, a question of wrestling what we want to see happening in terms of space activities, which are great for the benefit of humankind, but with a sector of human activity that's compromised by, by space. Um, not just astronomers, but you know, ordinary people looking at the sky, where by the end of the decade, we might see uh, at any instant, 100 satellites crossing the sky at, in twilight times. How do you, you know, how do you wrestle with issues like that? Forgive me, it's not the question I had in mind, but I'll put you on the spot with it. No, the, the challenge, that's a really um, interesting challenge. I think our sector's facing, it's astronomy from space and astronomy from Earth, and it's um, the two different space applications um, creating challenges um, between one another. And I think that it's a problem that we're certainly aware of. It's a problem that much of the world is aware of. And um, there's action being taken to try and minimise the impact of satellites on astronomy, but all the solutions aren't there yet. So it's um, certainly, particularly in Australia, with our excellent astronomy capabilities, it's especially important for that part of our scientific community. And um, we'll be addressing it for sure in our sustainability our roadmap that we're developing and certainly encourage um, astronomers to be discussing this issue with us as well. All right, thank you very much, Catherine. I think unfortunately we'll have to uh, uh, finish the Q&A session at this stage and I'd like to welcome uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Professor uh, Willie Svenepol, who is going to uh, give some closing remarks. So one of the good parts of the job of a dean, in fact, I think so, that the best part of the job of the dean is to enjoy the accomplishments of the students and the alumni of his faculty. And I must say, today is a really good day. I really impressed Catherine with the career trajectory that you have already made at a very young age, and that I'm sure is going to continue. I also want to really thank you for your talk. <clears throat> I think uh, the nation is clearly, you know, setting a goal of being prominent in, in space, and the university and the faculty certainly want to be part of that. And I think it's, uh, in that sense, your talk was very informative about what the areas are that we should be concentrating on. It's not only for us, of course, uh, jobs and innovation, although that's a very big part of the university as well, but it's also creating the workforce that you alluded to. Uh, I think space, uh, it's just a great attractor to engineering, and we know that in this country, many countries, we're very short on engineers, uh, so I think space is really an area that the faculty want to develop. Uh, I was actually a little boy when uh, Armstrong landed on the moon. It's, uh, I think, the only occasion where my parents allowed me to stay up at 3 a.m. in the morning to watch the actual uh, first step on the moon. And I think it also had something to do with me eventually becoming an engineer. Uh, I also lived for a long time in Houston which is the capital of the American space industry. It's also where then President Kennedy delivered his famous lecture where he 
called on the nation to put a man on the moon in the next decade, so I'm certainly very well aware of the importance of space, not only for its own sake, but also for everything that it brings in terms of medicine, in terms of birth uh, accomplishments. So in recognition and uh, to thank you for uh, coming here and giving this wonderful talk, the tradition is that we present the uh, innovation lecture with a small gift. Uh, it's a donation on behalf of the Warren Center that will be given in your name to Deadly Science that it has a very, very laudable goal, namely to produce, uh, to deliver educational resources and educational materials to uh, rural schools in the country. So you will be able to choose what uh, books or whatever it is that you want in terms of educational resources to be donated to that organization. So this is a little voucher, <laughs> thanks of that. Thank, you, Thank so you very much again for your talk. Uh, it was really, really wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs>